Sit Room Executives. Welcome back to another episode. If this is your first time listening to our podcast, make sure you hit the subscribe button below if you're on YouTube, or if you're listening to us on either iTunes or Podbean, make sure you subscribe to our RSS feed. Also, visit our website at www.multifamilyinvestorsituationroom.com and fill out the form to get your free gift, which is a market selection guide. It's a step-by-step guide to pulling data that I put together for you. And if you join our Facebook deal group, you will be able to access a free Excel file that I put together to help you organize that data. Today, we are going to hear from Jerome Myers. He leads the Myers Development Group LLC, which focuses on buying broken apartment building businesses and using innovative thinking and solid execution strategies to optimize the operational efficiency of the business. Currently, Mr. Myers is asset manager for approximately 90 units and 90,000 square feet of workforce housing across Virginia and North Carolina and he is on a mission to hold 1,000 doors by the end of 2028. When not actively working on his personal portfolio, he coaches other real estate investors on the Myers methods of multifamily investing. Outside of real estate, Jerome hosts the Dreamcatchers podcast, volunteers on STEM boards, and enjoys traveling internationally. Jerome Myers, welcome to the show. Dion, so glad to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining us today. So why don't we go ahead and get started? And can you tell us how you, uh, a little bit about your background and how you got started in uh, real estate? Yeah, man. So I'm the son of a soldier and a stay-at-home mom. Back in 2001, I got the opportunity to go to North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University get an engineering degree, played football for four years there, left from there, went into corporate America as a structural engineer, Um, matriculated through that, got identified as a high potential, um, did a number of different jobs, got on a leadership track, and then eventually I I said, I'm going to venture out and go into consulting. And so I went to a couple of different consulting firms. Then my last job in corporate America was building a $20 million division for a construction company. We're responsible for everything from securing a real estate to doing the engineering to put in the power lines underground. And so that is kind of the beginning of my real estate story. So uh, I was employee number two. We went from two to about 170 employees in that first year that I was working at that construction company. And then we got to the end of that year, we had to do layoffs. It was my first opportunity to do layoff. And I don't know if I really want to call it opportunity, but it was, you know, that situation where it's like, all right, Jerome, you, you've hired all these people. You, you know who's actually a performer. You know who's not. We've got to make some adjustments to staffing. And so in that, you know, you, you have to let people know that they're not going to have an opportunity to work here anymore. And you got to let the people decide who you absolutely want to keep on your team. And so we did that and it sucked, right? I think everybody who's worked for a pretty long time knows that layoffs suck and you start to realize that thing that was secure isn't so secure anymore because at any given moment, somebody can walk in and say, yeah, thanks for your services, but we don't need them anymore. And so we put all the pieces back together and in February, we start going down the path again with a smaller group this time. We're lean, we're me, trying to energize everybody. And then we get to Thanksgiving this time and they say, hey, we, we need to lay people off again. I'm like, hey, there's something wrong with this. And so during that January, December time frame, when I was going through that, not eating, not sleeping, I started thinking to myself, I got to figure out a way to get out of this situation so I never have to do this again. And so I started saving aggressively. I got to bank my bonus. And... I went in and asked for a promotion in like March because, hey, we got through the stuff. Hey, let let me get a little raise. Let me get a little promotion for doing this really uncomfortable thing. And we're like, no, the optics aren't right. Um, We just lay people off. You're not going to be rewarded for that. It's just part of the job. And so I started saving even more aggressively because now they tell me that my value wasn't where I thought it was. Mm -hmm. And 
We're just like, we have 20% profit margin. We did all these great things, right? And it's just like, or I'm sorry, 30% margin. But, you know, it, it was all out of my hands. I, I was always going to ask somebody else to do it. So I, I was already living pretty frugally. I started saving more aggressively, saved up a year's worth of savings. And when it came around and they're like, hey, we're going to lay off again. I was like, I'm done, guys. I'm mm-hmm. not doing this anymore. And so I'd been doing some private money, lending it to some folks that were fixing and flipping uh, and learning the business that way, um, checking on their projects, seeing how things were going. And so I was like, but I started thinking as I was doing all the soul searching is like, what, what should I really be doing? What, what really makes sense? And I thought about a conversation I had with my buddy Duran on the stoop in college where we were counting up how much money the guy who owned the complex was making. So it was a pretty large student housing complex. They were renting them out at about $400 a bedroom. I had two roommates. So, you know, there's 1,200 there. Downstairs, Duran lived, he had two roommates. That's 2,400. And when we added it all up, multiplied it by months, it ended up to be like $700,000 top line. And we never seen the guy. Mm-hmm. It was like, this is amazing. How do we do this? And it's like, his time is decoupled from his money. This money comes in everybody that we knew paid every month it was like we want to do this but we didn't know anybody we didn't know how to do it we didn't know anybody to ask and the part of the reason why i start with my story is you know my dad was a soldier i didn't have attorneys i didn't have lawyer or dentists i didn't have doctors coming to our house for dinner right like we were working class blue collar people and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but when you want to make that transition to go buy buildings you you need somebody to bring you into that and so the flipping piece or doing the hard money lending comes into play because I walked out and said, if somebody can afford to pay me 20% interest on my money, there must be money in this. And so the guy broke it down. He's like, it's just a cost of doing business. If I take your money, put it in a deal and I'm making 200% on the money, what, what does your two, 20% matter? Like, man, that's awesome. So I'm going to do that. After I went to the banks and I went to 10 different banks, Dion, and they said, hey, you don't have the right experience. I said, what do you mean mm-hmm. I don't have the right experience? I just built a $20 million business. Yeah, that's nice, but it's not apartments. I said, I got an MBA. Yeah, great. That's not apartments. Uh, I got an engineering license. No, not good enough. Project <laughs> management professional? No. And so I'm just going down all these things trying to be good enough again, right? So I went from you know trying to be good enough at my job and get rewarded at my job, and now I'm going to the bank like, I need you guys. And they're like, well, let me try one more thing. I got plenty of money, but here's my first financial statement. Yeah, not good enough. Credit score, 800? Nah, still not good enough. I'm just like, okay, what well, gifts? It's like, you need somebody who already owns this asset class that has signed a loan in order to go on the loan with you. Now, the first deal that we got into, they were absolutely right. There was a reason why they had those requirements, but you know, if you don't have somebody to bring you into the game, you're not getting in the game. And so, you know, that was probably the, the point where I realized it's all about your network. You can know everything in the world. You can be super smart, but if you're not connected with the right circle, your whole career can be at a halt. Right? Mm-hmm. Your, your whole business is jammed. And, you know, that was pretty painful. So I, I know I rambled for a little while, but I, I just wanted to try to get full context so we could have this discussion. Yeah. So can you, so can you just walk us, uh, because you started with private money lending. So can you walk us through that transition uh, from the time that you left uh, your job and you, you decided to go into multifamily? Did you go directly into multifamily or kind of what was that transition like? I tried to go directly into multifamily, Mm -hmm. but Felt miserably, right? I'm going mm-hmm. to the different banks. They're telling me, no, don't have the right experience. I got this business plan together. Like, this is sophisticated. It's sexy. Everybody's going to get excited about this story. Yeah, you don't have the right experience. And so what I ended up doing was going to fix and flip houses. And so I was doing that for about four or five months before somebody in the network with the experience showed up. And so I was sitting on the porch of one of my fix and flips and another investor came up. He's like, hey, man, let's check out. Let me check out your finishes. We're getting ready to do a house down the street. We want to see what's going in. Give us a preview of what the market is doing. I was like, sure, come on. And so we started talking while he was walking around. It's like, hey, there's a building that I, we're getting ready to put an offer in. I was like, a building? Where? Church Hill. Okay. And we kept going down the path. And he's like, yeah, 
Um, I was like, I wanted to buy that one. I tried to buy that by myself and they wouldn't let me do it. Please don't leave me out the deal. He was like, yeah, well, how much money are you going to bring? I said, well, it depends. Let's, let's just see if we can work something out. And so he went off and made the offer without me, of course, right? Because he didn't mm-hmm. need me. He had experience. He had the money. And they didn't accept the offer. And so it came back full circle. He went and talked to another one of my buddies who um, is another rehabber. And he came back. He said, oh, yeah, that's the one Jerome was talking about. I'm only doing that if he does it with me. And so I come in for project management. He comes in for general contract. And we got the money partner and the experience partner. And then the broker also came into the deal. And it was the four amigos. And then, you know what? We like, we got one piece missing. Let's go get a property manager. And so we brought a property manager and the five of us went into this deal, super heavy value add, um, and learned a ton in that experience. Learned absolutely a lot from doing that experience. Okay. How many, how big was that deal? 23. 23. Okay. Got it. Got it. So, uh, so you ended up connecting with the guy that had the experience to sign on the loan, basically to secure the loan, correct? Yep, he'd just done like a 10 or a 15 unit six months mm-hmm. before. Okay, got it, got it. So then from there, um, so from there, like, uh, what is it that uh, you've been working on at this point? Like, what have you transitioned to uh, from that project? Yeah, so that's awesome, man. I appreciate you asking that question. So I, I took my talents to South Beach, right? <laughs> I got my loan guarantee or, you know, I signed my loan. So now I could go do whatever I want to do because now I'm an expert. Banks mm-hmm. want to talk to me. Um, we had an article published as people started reaching out. Hey, you want to refi that? You want to go do something else? Um, talk to us. Give us the opportunity to put an a interest rate on it and give you some terms. And I was like, oh, this is different than you know a year ago when I was trying to get in on my own and so we went and basically took our whole operation in Greensboro North Carolina and we've just been buying deals we've done four transactions and we've got another one under contract um, the new one that we're working on is 120 well it's 115 uh, unit development mm-hmm. um, six acres in opportunity zone called technology row um, and you know we we've done a bunch of different value add type properties, um, whether it's a renovation type style one where you, you renovate the units, raise the rents. But we've also done stuff from an operational standpoint. We bought a student housing property and transitioned it to workforce housing. Our business model is surrounded or centered on workforce housing. And so we mm-hmm. want to help solve the issues that you know teachers, police officers, firefighters are dealing with, with finding affordable housing for them and their families potentially. And so we like two and three bedroom properties in in our market and our range. We usually buy stuff in the 500s with the ambition of moving them to seven, north of 700 over the course of three years. Mm-hmm. Okay, got it. So you, so you're, 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 you're using or looking for value add opportunities, but kind of more so in the uh, workforce housing range and some of them may be you mentioned the one the first one that you did was a pretty heavy lift right you said that was oh, a heavy value add yeah I mean mm-hmm. it, I don't think it gets much heavier roof siding parking lot okay landscaping adding a washer and dryer and bathroom on the first floor taking the wall out all new flooring paint throughout granite countertops stainless steel appliances like we touched every surface Got it. Got it. All the way to, you just mentioned another one. You said a project that's 115 units, I think, if I heard correct. And that's a construction uh, project right now? Yep. So we were doing a project with uh, one of the senior classes at North Carolina A&T. And we got an opportunity to speak at a housing summit. And one of the affordable housing developers had a site that wasn't going to work for them. We gave us opportunity to write a contract on it. So we're buying, you know, six acres of land at a really, really reasonable rate. And then we've got the opportunity to build three-story walk-ups and townhomes on that property. Um, going through the wetland permitting process right now. And then we'll, we'll be ready to get everything designed up and, and go to construction. Got it. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, that's really, really impressive. Um, so you guys are working a variety of, of strategies than, than here. Uh, so 
let, let's just kind of, I'm sure you've, there's a, it seems as though you have a wealth of experience, you know, that you can share with our listeners, which is wonderful. Um, so let's kind of hone in on some challenges. One you've already mentioned, the first one being where you were making that transition uh, and trying to get started in multifamily and you were getting turned down by a lot of lenders because of the experience requirement that they were looking for. Um, so what are some other notable challenges uh, that you've been faced with and how have you dealt with those? Yeah, I mean, I think there's probably three major challenges, maybe four, but it's always experience, money. And I think the last one is confidence in your ability to execute the business plan mm -hmm. because you don't know what you're buying, right? And so if somebody hasn't done their first deal, they wouldn't be able to really resonate with this, but I, I liken apartment buildings to wild animals and we buy broken apartment buildings. We want to find the properties that aren't performing so that we can come in or, well, one, we want to identify the problem and then two, we want to come in and fix that problem. And if we can do those things, we know that we'll be rewarded by the market. Um, when you know that there's one problem, there's also some other issues below the surface that you can't see. And so finding those out after you close is always what I consider terrifying, right? You might not have budgeted enough money. You may have not forecasted enough time to get through the, the renovations or the transition of the leases or whatever your strategy is. And so going into those things without somebody kind of looking over your shoulders can be tough. And, you know, that experience piece is, I think, invaluable and in, in being successful in executing the business plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So being able to execute on the business plan. So uh, the, per the individual or the person that you mentioned that signed on to the loan before, if, if I may ask, are you guys still working together? Like, or, or is he serving as like a mentor or, how is it that you are, you're executing on your business plan? Um, you know, right now you said having someone look over your shoulder or, you know, do you have a mentor or? No. So okay. doing it with brute force and being extremely aggressive. Uh, so, I mean, I'm doing it full time. This isn't a side hustle for me. Mm -hmm. um, I listen to probably 40 hours a week of content um, just to make sure that my saw, saw is as sharp as it can be being a, extremely diligent with our property managers and just looking for, you know, that competitive advantage at the end of the day. No. So when that partnership was really tough experience for me, um, one thing that I learned is you really want to know your partners before you get into the deal. And so it's always interesting when you see people meet at a conference and then two months later, or two weeks later, they're in business together and they're going to go into this five to 10 year relationship where they're going to own a property, go through some really stressful situations and come out on the other side as, you know, shining stars. Usually that's not what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, I like in getting into business with other people as getting married to them, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're tying your financial future together. And so you don't get married after a one night stand normally. Mm -hmm. And I don't recommend that people get into business together when they don't truly know who they're dealing with. You know, you really want to understand their values. You want to see what happens with them when they get stressed. You want to know that your interests are absolutely aligned because if they aren't, you're setting yourself up for failure each time that one of those boxes aren't checked. Um, and so, the, um, you know, for us, I went back to the group of friends and people that I've known, some of them since high school, and did the friends and family thing. And it's a big part of the reason why we don't uh, JV or why we don't syndicate. Mm -hmm. We want to work with people that we know, like, and trust. And it's not just people that we meet recently who have a common interest in multifamily is people who come from the same place we come from but made it out of all the traps and they have a long history of you know my track record on being successful and being able to figure out really tough challenges and understanding my integrity and who I am as a person and me understanding them and being in a space where everybody respects everybody around the table it doesn't matter if you're a multimillionaire or you're a hundred thousand air or if you're a ten thousand air whatever it is everybody sitting around the table respects everybody and what they bring to the game um you know our our structure is set up that everybody's 
expected to do something to contribute to the property being successful, whether it's mm -hmm. participating in our meetings, whether it's actually interacting with the property managers, finding vendors, whatever it is, everybody's got a role. And that's the whole point of having a JV. And the biggest reason that I decided not to do something else in corporate America, go back after fixing a flip and I realized that was a job is because I wanted to control who I work with. Right. And so if I can, partner with people that I really know, like, and trust, that gets exciting for me, right? And now that their money's in the deal, they've got a vested interest in talking to me about this crazy apartment thing that I do that none of their other friends do, right? And so now we're all sticking our chests out because we own apartments and nobody else owns apartments. Yeah, you can get your single family. We got apartments, guys. And so that part's, you know, super exciting for us. Mm -hmm. Got it. So for you mentioned uh, joint venturing. So for some of our listeners out there, could you tell us a little bit about um, kind of the difference between the, the JV structure and the syndication structure? Yeah, man. So I actually just did a talk on this at uh, Dan Haffer's Multifamily Investor Nation Conference. But I, I think I'll just boil it down to maybe two points. The first point, I think it's called the Huey test, but there's four um, criteria that determine whether or not you're selling securities. And the answer to the first three questions is yes. The last question is, is the effort, the business venture solely based on the effort of the promoter, right? And it, the answer to that with the JV has to be no, right? If, it, if the answer is yes, if you got people who just put their money in and they all just want to be passive investors, you've got a syndication, you sold securities, you're not doing it the right way. But if you expect everybody to participate, you expect everybody to vote, you expect everybody to have a hand in the project being successful, then you actually have a joint venture business. And so that is the biggest uh, difference. The joint venture just means that you're leaving the other people out of the game and that would be the limited partners and I, I compare it like a fighter jet and a jumbo jet the JV well let me do the jumbo jet first so the syndication you got the pilot you got the co-pilot you got the stewardess they're getting paid by the airline company to run the plane they're they're operating the plane and then you got all the passengers and the limited partners are those passengers they pay to get on the plane um, and that means basically you know every dollar that they put in there isn't a dollar for dollar ownership structure, right? There'll be like some type of split, 70, 30, 80, 20, whatever the split is. And so their dollar is only worth 80 cent of equity when they put their money in the deal. Amazing model if you're accredited. Mm -hmm. If you're still trying to grow wealth and create wealth like I am, probably not the best model, but you know, it all depends on what you actually have time for. With the fighter jet, you know, the joint venture, you know, everybody's got an active role. You're looking for bad guys, you're shooting the guns, whatever it is, <laughs> you're flying the plane, but whatever you're doing, everybody's engaged. There is no room for extra people to go along for a sightseeing tour. And so when I was young, I ended up being too tall, but I wanted to be a fighter jet pilot. And so my dad was in the army, we would have, uh, jets flying over the house and it's just like that is the coolest thing in the world and so now i actually get to live out that dream of being a, a fighter jet pilot i want to do a lot of things but that one's probably one of the coolest ones mm -hmm. got it nice i love that analogy so um <clears throat> basically and it just you know check me here uh if i'm wrong so my understanding why you chose the jv structure over the syndication structure then because this was my next question um is because you like having everyone involved and you feel that that can kind of uh, push the business or the business plan forward much faster? Is that the, the thinking behind it? No, you know, if I'm completely honest, the real mm -hmm. reason why I like JVs is you got to start where you are, right? Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have a ton of accredited investors who wanted to fork over 50, 100, $150,000 into my deal. And in addition to that, I didn't have this extensive track record of performance where I had taken deals full cycle. I need to start with my friends and family. And mm -hmm. just by virtue of, you know, being the son of a soldier and going to state schools and, um, you know, just the by virtue of my network, those are the people that were closest to me. The, the issue, and I, I guess I can't call it an issue. You can do a B exemption or a C exemption 
in your syndication model. And with the B exemption, you know, you'll be able to get some non-accredited or sophisticated investors in the deal. But the fact of the matter for me is that was really, really great, right? Mm -hmm. What makes somebody sophisticated? What makes it a pre-existing relationships? And so when you start going down that path, there's a lot of opportunity for you to mess up and get things wrong versus I want to start a business with my buddies and now we're going to go execute against this business plan and create wealth for their future. The other thing that I wanted to do, Dion, is create a situation where other people were getting that checkbox, right? Other people signing these personal guarantees for loans so that if they wanted to go do it on their own, they absolutely could because they actually had the experience, right? Each time that we do a deal, we want to bring at least one new person into the deal that doesn't have that experience so that if they want to go expand it, they can. And so for me, it's about opening a door and creating an opportunity for people to uh, generate wealth for not only themselves, but for future generations. Um, the days of the rich just getting richer are kind of over for me. My goal is to open a door and let all my friends in the back door because we didn't have that event. We didn't have that experience. We didn't have that relationship. And I, I, I want to help other people get into the game because I'm seeing tons of people create tremendous wealth here. And why not us do it once we got in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. That's really good. <clears throat> so do you see yourself uh, at some point in the future, maybe uh, syndicating deals or kind of just maybe only doing uh, JVs going forward? So I, I started to think that I was going to have to do um, a syndication at some point. And then I met a guy who did a $50 million JV. Wow. <laughs> and, I was, and it was only two partners in the deal. So I was like, well, there goes that bubble. There isn't a deal that's too big where you absolutely have to do that, right? Um, will there be opportunities for us to syndicate? Sure, I'm sure there will be. And the great part about our model is with the syndication, that JV that we're doing just sits on the top. It's just called the GP now, right? Mm -hmm. And then you just have other people investing in the deal. But we'll have the track record from all of our JV deals to bring to that general partnership whenever we create that. And so um, the paperwork's a little bit different, but the model's the same. Like for us, we're just learning with the people that are closest to us. It's kind of a friends and family round. Got it. So what would you suggest uh, for new people that are looking to get into the business? My favorite question, right? Where I get to poke myself in the eye and jiggle my finger around. Don't do it the way I did it, guys. Like, it's the most inefficient and ineffective way to do it. Listening to 40 hours of content a week doesn't make sense, right? Because at the end of the day, probably only four hours of that content is useful. The rest of it is just me hearing something I've already heard or hearing something that's not applicable to the business that I'm working in. So put yourself in a situation where you're getting the content curated for you. And I think the other thing that was probably silly was I was frustrated because there were so many people with different views of, on the world, right? They're looking at a picture from one way, it's this way, and a person from the other way is looking at it. And all of them were trying to further their mission, either grow their syndication business or whatever they were doing. But at the end of the day, I was confused because I didn't have a base. I, I didn't have a base uh, knowledge or body of knowledge that would allow me to form my opinion. And so I spent all this time trying to mold this mound of clay into some type of statue. And so what we did out of that frustration is we created Myers methods and it talks, it takes somebody through our four step process, right? So we create a four step process, find it, fund it, fix it and flip it, where we take, we show people how we do our deals. And the goal is to squeeze all of that content that I spent my time listening to down into digestible modules that somebody can take and go be actionable against that. And then once they have that as their base, they can continue to do the self-education stuff that they've been doing to supplement it. And in that, you've got this base perspective, hey, Jerome and his multifamily friends think about it this way. 
Uh, Michael Blank thinks about it that way. Rock Khalif thinks about it this way. Joe Fairless, Whitney Sully, John Kasman, you got all these different people, Willie Smith, who are putting their things out into the world. And, but you've got this base to start with. And that for me gets you so much further down the path than listening to the 10 or 15 different podcasts and YouTube channels that I listen to and trying to figure out, hey, this goes with that and this goes with this. Um, that part is, is huge. And so we give out a, um, we'll do it for your listeners. We got a free four step guide where mm-hmm. we talk about the differences between JVs and syndications. Um, there's also a 15 minute podcast where we dive really deep on that and why we think JVs are superior. Um, and one of the big things for me, Dion, and I'll, I'll just put it out there, man. Like, I don't think you have to buy a used BMW in order to get into this game. I know there's a lot of people who've got their 25 or 30 or $50,000 cores, and it's going to teach you all the things. And if you do want syndication deal, the asset management fee is going to get you all your money back and then some. But the fact of the matter is most people's first deal isn't a syndication. They don't have any experience. And so if they get invited to the GP, it's because they raised money or they did something else. No, go do a JV, guys. Let's go do a JV, get you some experience. And then from there, you need to buy a bigger deal because the law of the first deal is a real thing. After the first deal comes, the next one comes faster and it's better and it's probably bigger than the first one. And so you start building your momentum that way. And then once you actually find out, hey, I can do this business, I wanna do this business, then if you wanna make the investment, for you know syndication education go do it then because now you got some experience you figured out if you actually like the business and you got something else to point back to um you know the one thing i will say that i I think i left out that i probably should have said when i look at um, those folks who come into deals as lps um the fact of the matter is they're just buying an illiquid security and so as an lp if you have ambition to do your own deal at some point, I'm not sure why you will lock your cash up for five years or seven years, right? Because mm-hmm. you can't get that money back out. You just bought an illiquid security. Just go buy a re if you want to put your money to work passively. If you really want to get into the game and do some deals, find a JV or find a GP where you can get into those spaces because that's where the rubber really meets the road and that's where you actually get your experience. Mm-hmm. Got it. So what would you say would be some good uh, reading material for new people? So it's a, that's a great question. I think Joe's Fairless's book, it's a $50 book um, on syndication is probably the, the best piece out there for folks that want to do the type of uh, syndication deals. We're releasing a joint venture book here in the next month or so, and it'll probably be out when this episode hits. Oh, nice. But yeah, we, the, the goal is just to fill that gap, right? Because everybody's first deal is usually smaller. And so um, that book's going to be called The Myers Methods of Multifamily Investing. Okay. Um, and it, it'll be part of the body of knowledge. We've got the virtual course. We've got some free training. We've got a closed Facebook group. And we've got the conference coming up as well, so. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I I would I would like to read that myself and uh, and and provide. Is that going to be on Amazon or? Yeah, we'll put it on Amazon in addition to making it a part of our our training stuff. But yeah, okay. We'll, we'll have it out on Amazon. Okay, great. Yeah, I definitely want to share the link to that. Um, definitely looking forward to this one. So, how can uh, our listeners get a hold of you if they wanted to reach out to you? Yeah, man, I, I post all the time on LinkedIn. I think that's the best way to do it. So I'm J-E-R-O-M-E-M-Y-E-R-S on LinkedIn. I'm the only one in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, love to connect with you guys, see if we can figure out something to get you jump started on your journey and either finding your first or your next deal. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jerome. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. And, uh, you know, definitely looking forward to, uh, you know, continue our conversations in the future. Great, man. Thanks, Dion. Thanks for having me.